Let's get started with some introductions. My name is Tun Trivastava. I'm the co-founder and the CEO of Base10. Base10 is a machine learning application builder designed to make building and shipping machine learning powered applications super fast. I'm really excited to be chatting with DJ today. DJ has been a role model for me, honestly, for almost a decade now. And as someone who started in data and machine learning, it really has transcended the traditional boundaries um, that other folks in the field have faced. You know, DJ, I'm really excited to have you here. You've spent time as an academic in industry, as a chief scientist, a VP of product, a CTO, and then, you know, remarkably had a massive impact using data to benefit the country, you know, as, as chief scientists. And then with the coronavirus response, I think it's really rare to have someone who spans such a breadth of areas and always had the energy to continue to drive forward into newer and exciting roles. I know this is open-ended and trite, but can you tell us really quickly about you know, how you got here? Yeah. You, you know, it, it's first, you're making me feel really old. <laughs> I say it like it's a decade. Uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think for the way we fall into the roles in our lives is, is really a function of a couple of things. One, it's curiosity. It's where we find passion. And the other is it's who you're fortunate enough to have around you or the choices you make of who you're willing to put around yourself. And I, I think I've had the very good fortune early on in my life, especially in, in high school, where I didn't always make the best choices on that by some of the people I hung out with, some of my own type of life choices where you know, I wasn't the good student and I had somehow convinced myself I was really bad at math. And I wasn't going to be ever good at math, but luckily I had a really great junior college and that forced me into this world of taking kind of elementary math classes because my girlfriend was taking them. So of course I had to take them. And what it turned out was my prior assumptions about myself were wrong, that I could be good at math. I could actually fall in love with math, weirdly enough, as that sounds. And from that, it kind of carried me forward into this, this world of what you can do with math. There's a quote I keep on my desk. It's actually from one of my PhD advisors, Jim York, who's the guy who coined the term chaos and chaos theory. And his degree in math is a license to study the universe. A degree in math is a license to study the universe. And for me, the extension of that is, is data also. What I was really excited about was this idea that well, what if we use data to understand the world around us, which is for many people out there, it's like, duh, isn't that how you're supposed to do science? And it is. What, what's novel is the volume and the amounts of data that we can, we can process. And people have been trying this for years. The Mayans have been doing this forever, right? They like, you know, as an ancient society, they were doing this. So what we're able now to do is bring a different degree of computation. That's been able to unlock so many different things. And for me, what I've been most lucky about is I've been able to wander from different kind of project areas to different disciplines that have a thematic sense of data, design, technology, all underpinning it. And because data is this universal and that license to explore the universe, I feel I've been in a very privileged position to be able to explore a lot of very different domains. Yeah, that is, I mean, that's so much more philosophical than I, I thought you were going to answer with. Oh, that's fantastic. And, and so it sounds like what you're saying is early on in your life, math wasn't a priority for you. And you were kind of told that wasn't the case. Like, would, would you say that through junior college and being introduced in that way, almost given, being given the license to fail? Or, or, you know, lowering all the pressure by going that route. That's really, you know, what allowed you to flourish and, and get more excited by it. I think there's something special about our society, especially here in the United States, very Silicon Valley-esque. And I, I use Silicon Valley here as a marker for all this technology ecosystems, is your permission to fail. It's okay to fail. And what I didn't realize er until early on was like, hey, everyone fails at something. And what I was lucky enough to do was fail very early. 
and was able to realize like, wait a second, you could do this. I think one of the most important things for me about getting a PhD in math was you have to learn how to rely on yourself at the deepest, darkest moments. And, and you're a founder. <laughs> you, yeah. I mean, this is like, this is a quintessential moment of a founder is like, there's no one else except to, for you to rely on yourself. It's this aspect. When somebody, and, and that version may be this grandiose thing, like you get the freedom to design a new company, but it's also the freedom when you get access to a database and you get to ask any question you want. Like yeah. the number of times a data scientist or a person with a clever idea that has changed the outcome of a company is not small. It's yeah. a lot of people. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think you've said a couple of things so well here. One of the things that when people ask me what it's like to be a founder is that at the end of the day, you know, you, you know, I feel like when you work at another job, oftentimes it's easy to blame others. It's easy to blame circumstance. As a founder, you're going and staring in the mirror and you, the buck stops, really does stop at you. And I think the analogy of that with, with being a mathematician is um, fantastic. But I think the, the real great upside of being a founder that I found is that it's exactly that, is that people want to trust you, but they're also willing to stop thinking about everything that can go wrong for a minute to think about what will happen if something succeeds. If you can get aligned with that, there's so many beautiful things, either company building in projects or even just a career, right? That, that's, you, you nailed it. And part of this, I think, which is important to also highlight is that this, these journeys can be incredibly taxing. You know, they can be very lonely. They, they can be mentally exhausting. And they, there's a lot of impact that we're seeing in the world from mental health issues. How do you counter that? It's by having good people that you can rely on, trusted people. It's not like I just was a good mathematician and that just happened. That's far, far from it. There were people like Takashi Nishikawa, who was kind of my partner in crime for so much of my research. It was Ishvan Sunyo, who was my uh, next door to me in my office. There was all my advisors. There was Suzanne Cindy, who bounced ideas off of. There was like a team. There was a team of people that I could go, oh, I don't know how to do this. What do you think? And they might show me. And so, you know, there's a saying I like to often espouse to others and hope that it helps. But as much as I have to say it to myself many times over, data science is a team sport. And I think when we treat it as a company, as a team sport, we treat it as life as a team sport, then it's not only more fun, but we tend to be able to have more success. Yeah, that, that's, that's pretty special, right? It's, it's special, one, that you can surround yourself with those people, um, but two, you know, people have that longer term, longer term vision about the upsides as opposed to the downsides. One thing that it seems with you is that you're always working on so many different things. And I'm guessing you're going to say for better or for worse, but I mean, you know, even in the past two years, you've helped with the coronavirus response, you've been the CTO of Devoted Health, being the fellow at, being a fellow at Belfa. And I'm sure that's only a small part, you know, your annual investor as well. It's only a small part of all, all the things you do. I think as engineers and data scientists, we're, we're all very curious people, right? And, you know, there's always like, can I be working on something? Is there something that's like, how, how do you, firstly, like, how do you decide where and what you want to spend your time on? And I think the follow-up to that, it would be like, how do you, how do you manage, like, at least for me, the biggest thing that, you know, is important within a company's expectation setting and making sure you don't let people down. How do you manage all these opportunities that you, you get to be a part of? Yeah, I mean, it's it's fascinating. It's a really great question. So first, you know, people think like I have a team that I work with that's just team DJ or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's, unfortunately, it's me. And, it, and as you know, it, it is only me because like I'm really bad at email. <laughs> <laughs> like the amount of time or scheduling, people are like, ah, oh, doesn't he have a schedule? I'm like, no. no, it's, no it's, 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 it's just, it's, it's uh, sorry. No, uh, that's it right now. You know, the, the part which I, I would say is I operate across a few different models. The first is I really learned in life early on that you should always have a portfolio of things you're somewhat bouncing between. Doesn't mean like you're so scattershot, but there's a few different things that you're focused on because something inevitably will stall on one and you kind of run up against a wall, but then you kind of rotate to that next thing 
And then you kind of maybe rotate back. You kind of yeah. rotate back and forth and something breaks through. There's also a set of things where there it's all consuming. So during the COVID response, there was nothing else in life. Like <laughs> that was that was it. Like like and it was heads down, eighteen plus hours a day, hundred plus days. You just go at it. Now once you kind of back off of that, you can create a little bit of room to work on other things or let other things kind of percolate. Same with helping run the Biden Harris transition. That just took up. There was no room for anything else. But then if you get these spaces where other things can happen, then you can kind of go, well, where can I add value through my time or energy? And the analogy I literally use is, is momentum. And momentum is mass times velocity. Uh, and, and so mass is either people or dollars. And if you don't start with anything, it's going to take some work. you got to figure out how to get that. Velocity is a vector. So there's a magnitude, which is how fast is something moving and the direction it's going. And so you can change the direction, but if it's moving really fast, if you change the direction a little bit, it's going to take a while for it to change. And so you can use this analogy to ask yourself, of the things you're working on, what has momentum? And some things are just not ripe to get traction and other things absolutely are. So, so very specifically, you know, there's a with saying that what is often attributed in policy circles is never let a good crisis go to waste. So there's a ton we want to do on policing and policing reform, community policing, mental health issues in the space of, of using data and technology. We didn't have the window to do so until, unfortunately, there was a number of these murders, police shootings, offenses that then showed predominantly people of color, uh, especially black men who were harmed, hurt, killed, murdered. And those then suddenly gave us a window to say, could we do something different? Could we show something different? And that ability, that movement gave us the ability to bring in people, bring in dollars. So now we had mass. And it allowed us to start with something that had very little velocity, but find other people who had ideas and say, hey, we're not about reinventing the space. Is there a way we could come together? Could we make this a team sport? And yeah. if we collected this, could we align our vectors so that we get one super scalar? And, and that's really the approach I'm kind of looking at across the different things. I'm like, huh, can I add value? And if there's something where I can add value, my, my kind of usual thing is like, I don't think I can add value here, time to move on. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's great. And, and so, do then I, I, I guess, like, just so I understand, like, because, you know, I think that was, you, said, you said a lot there, it's that, you know, almost having a lot of irons in the fire is kind of like this building ground. So when the opportunity is right, you can jump onto whichever one you need to. Like, for example, the fact that you were so intertwined with data and the government already, when COVID came around, the opportunity, you know, you had kind of gone past that initial I need to throw myself and you're ready to jump right into it. Is, is, is that kind of what? Yeah, what, I think it, I believe it was Pasteur who said opportunity favors a prepared mind. Yeah. And, and there's a version of that. Now you can easily be a mile wide and an inch deep. And I think you do, there is yeah. that it can cut the other way. What I have found is that if you are always going a little bit beyond, you may not have the bandwidth to do all these other things, but if you have the ability to do one other job, can I give you a very concrete yeah. example? So at the, it, when I was at the White House, and, and this is sort of a very high flying, literally example of this, you'll see in a second, it, it, but it, it, it sort of shows that this can happen at the highest levels of government or power. So it, um, it was very explicit that President Obama said that national security should not be part of my portfolio. And the reason for that is that it kind of had been one of my big focus areas previously. And I was, he wanted people like me to really, who had technical skills to focus on domestic issues, predominantly healthcare. Like how do we develop tailored genetic treatments? So kind of was like off my list. I happened to, to run into a friend who was a, a VC and her husband had just been appointed as secretary of defense. <laughs> and you no, know, I didn't really know her husband, but knew of him. 
And we just kind of, and I, I, I had some ideas and he's like, yeah, well, why don't we see if we can do something together? But it's very rare that somebody from the White House just flies on and travels yeah. to Secretary of Defense. It's, it's not the way it's supposed to work. Uh, and Secretary Carter did not have anyone from the National Security Council travel with him. He had his kind of his core team. So the first time he was going out to Silicon Valley, I wrote up this quick thing about saying, hey, here's how you might want to think about engaging the community. It's the first time in 30 years that Secretary of Defense is actually traveling out to Silicon Valley, which is hard to believe, but here's some ideas. So I said, hey, could you just fly out with us so that we have some concrete time to work through these issues? So I'm on the jet. There's a kind of the primary, the secretary's office, and it's like all fancy. You got logos on the plane, you know, flags. It's, it's pretty cool, right? And it's like, cool. then they've got like kind of his chief of staff and sort of like where like the, the desk, they're actually desks on the plane where they're running everything. Then there's the next seats, which is kind of next level of staffers. And then there's kind of press. There's actually two staffer sections of press. And so depending on where you are, close up to the secretary is how important you are. I'm not very important. <laughs> I'm like back near the press. And he kind of comes up and says, hi. So I decide like during like way up there, I just walk up to, to the chief of staff and his, uh, and his comms team. I'm like, hey, just let you know, I'm here on the jet. If there's something I can help on, totally here to help. If not, that's also okay. So they gave me the, the speech. They, they, they were like, read this. So I go back and I rewrite everything. And, you know, the next thing I know, they're like, this is like, we're just working together. We're doing stuff together. Yeah. Go, finally, it turns out the trip is a success. We go home. I write up a memo for the Secretary of Defense. And it's like 3 a.m. I'm already on no sleep. I'm already got my day job at the White House. And I write this extra thing up about how we might be able to engage in national security in a different way to actually... To, to support national security, which became the defense digital service. So now I had a side hustle, which is supporting the secretary of defense when the president has said, you shouldn't really do that. <laughs> so the secretary, like it turned out as we're working on it, the secretary of defense finally goes, to, Ash Carter goes to president Obama and says, Hey, I need DJ on these specific issues. And he says, yes. The, the reason I come in this detail is even at the white house, I kind of had a side hustle to support yeah. an agency. If I can do that, there's nothing that prevents somebody else from doing it. The question is, how do you approach doing it? And by me just kind of going up and saying like, can I add value? Yeah. If I can add value, that's cool. But I'm going to take a little bit of my sleep, my time to try to add value and solve a problem for you. That creates collaboration. I, I think you've said that so well, which is, you know, just go going that one step above and go writing that memo. I was like, if you didn't write that memo, it probably wouldn't have happened, right? Like how many times we in life have had this thing of like, I should have, could have, totally, kind of yeah. moment, right? And you're just like, ah, I just didn't do it. But if yeah. we took that one extra step, and I tell people this in the companies all the time, go look at everyone else's goals. Choose one person where you can help solve their goal, their yeah. problem. You will learn more about the company, more about them. You will develop a lifelong friend, a companion, and it'll be more fun. And they'll come to you next time as well. Like, you know, I think it's, actually, it's interesting bringing this back to the data science world and, you know, talking to friends and customers where a lot of the times they're like, oh, I just don't have the support of my peers to, to work on this project or work on this project with this specific group. And my, my response to that is, well, that's an opportunity. Right, which, which is, you know, spend, spend the extra few hours at nighttime, or spend your nights and weekends, um, you know, go, doing that, whatever it is, like the 10, 10 hours of work that you need to do. Because honestly, that's really the activation energy a lot of the time. The, the thing that I think we often fail to do, and especially as data scientists, we're guilty of this, is we look at it as data and we forget yeah. who's behind the data. And it's the data points. I, I remember, you know, when I was first going in the country, one of the most important things was to find people who had done this before. Yeah. And, and there are these amazing people who basically taught me, uh, like they were like, here's what you need to do if you go in country, here's what you need to do. I met like, a, you know, these people who had defected, 
who I got connected to. Now, what is the difference between this and doing customer discovery? Nothing, no difference. What prevents us from just sort of saying like, hey, I wonder what, what, why we're like, why this is an issue of importance to somebody. We, we rarely have the courage to go ask. Tell me about it. Yeah, it's, I think initiative and probably the smallest amount, amount of thoughtfulness and, and you're probably at the cusp of, you know, yeah. the most help someone's offered them in, in months or years. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's fantastic. And one thing I did want to talk about was, you know, the position as chief data scientist, and I feel like you kind of touched upon this and gone a bit deeper, but, you know, it, it seems super ambitious and forward thinking. So for the government to invest that early in, in this function, um, it was like 2014, is that right? Uh, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. It's not 14 years, but most like, you know. I have to look at my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> but like, like, but like only, only like what, like 5% of comp tech companies even probably had, you know, data and data science functions that were, were mature, that weren't just very ad hoc. Um, can you talk about, you know, why this position was created? to start with? And then, you know, what were your key learnings and, and challenges? Like how did the government think about data and what was the hard part about working with data inside the government? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the real credit of this lies with Pre President Obama. I mean, this is his vision. Yeah. Uh, and I think what started this is during his campaign, you got to see how really grassroots efforts were utilizing technology and data to create a movement. You know, they weren't this sort of big behemoth vehicle. They had this very um, loosely coupled federation of grassroots organizers and community organizers that were able to use data and technology in novel ways. And I think he's got to see that, wow, something is changing. This is simultaneously, you know, companies are like LinkedIn and Facebook are starting to use data in novel ways and, and Google. And so we're like, hey, the beginning of data science is really taking taking hold at the beginning of the Obama administration. In that, you know, he decides to create a chief technology officer for the United States, which is kind of surprising that there isn't one. Yeah, you know, there's science advisor, and you realize that science and technology are now are such large drivers of our economy and life. They're actually a job that's too big for one person. They need to be two different roles. And so that first uh, CTO is Anish Chopra, and uh, Anish and I both moved to DC that sort of early in our career at the same time, so we knew each other. And the second CTO was Todd Park, and, and yep. Todd also both a, a very strong data evangelist. And so Anish and Todd had both carried the baton of open data, both through primarily through healthcare, but so many other ways. And while why isn't all the data that is federal by default open to the public. It's, we paid for it. Like we're paying, it's our, it's our taxpayer money. We support this. Why can't, why do we have to buy our own data back? So he kind of looked at those pieces and said, yeah, we, sh we should codify this. When the, the position of CTO was then handed and government is very much a baton that you hand to the next person and we let them run the next relay. As Megan Smith picked up the baton to run with it, her focus uh, by mandate of the president was like, look, we've done a lot on data. We need to focus on education, broadband, all these uh, disparities. Like well, there's so much to focus on. And the question was like, what do we do with all this data stuff? And it was like, hey, isn't this time to graduate it? Like there, there's gotta be something else. There's gotta be this other thing. And so that graduation became, who's gonna look after this forever going forward? And that should be the US chief data scientist. And the role there that's very specific, the reason it's data scientist, not data officer, is the mission statement is to responsibly unleash the power of data to benefit all Americans. Yeah. Two words that were very carefully chosen with the president and his team was responsibly, just because we can doesn't mean we should, yeah. and benefit all Americans. And you could easily extend this to the whole world, right? There's yeah. no reason that you can't, you can't extend it. That role and sort of that charter then says, how are you going to do this? Well, one, what are we going to focus on? And so the framework was impacts more than 50% of the population, $1 trillion of U.S. spend, or a population that has no recourse. What falls into that? Healthcare, criminal justice reform, national security, 
But there's so many other things that people forget about. The fact that a person who's trans or non-binary and walks through a scanner at, 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 in the airport and the scanner doesn't know what to do because it has only been configured to say male, female and look for issues. That is embarrassing given that we are the country that has flown a probe or landed on every single planet in the solar system. We're the yeah. only country that has ever done that. And yet we can't get a TSA scanner to recognize how to think about a person in a dignified, respectable way. That is a failure of using technology both responsibly as well yeah. as to benefit people. Yeah. And so like those problems are the type of problems that the US chief data scientists should tackle. And, and we created everything from the precision medicine initiative to data-driven justice to all these other initiatives to yeah. show how that happens as well as create data scientists and data officers across the federal organization to create a constellation of people who are going to ensure that the mission is, is held true for the American people. Yeah, that, 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 it, 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 it's interesting how functional that sounds. You know, like, you know, often, and when I say that, oftentimes when people talk about the government, you know, you wouldn't think that, right? But the way, way you're describing it is, is way more functional than most technology organizations. And so really translating, you know, data into a problem-based approach as opposed to a, as you said, a research or a data approach. And I think uh, it, it says a lot about, you know, the folks involved in that effort um, that they were able to think so, you know, progressively and, and articulately um, about making data matter for the government. Yeah, to our credit, like, I think one thing we have to recognize is oftentimes, and I'm sure there's people out there who also recognize this movement wasn't only done by the United States. You know, there's a team in the UK who had been really focusing on this at the state and local level, Code for America had been doing. So there's been a collective movement. Yeah. And, and this has been a team sport equally as much as people have tried to do this. And, and I'll say one of the most powerful things that I learned as, as chief data scientist, you can call anybody you want and, and anybody, people will have ideas for you. They yeah. go have round tables and be like, I don't know. The government, federal government isn't great at innovation. The federal government is great at what says we, we call scout and scale. You look for ideas and you say, oh, I wonder if that idea with this idea, maybe that'll work across the country or the world. And yeah. so you can do that. Yeah, totally. And I think you're able to draw from these immense experiences, but you know, all these things translate to you know, this thing we were talking about a minute ago within companies, within like finding other people to work with and seeing where you can have be the most impact driven and, and, and I think that kind of like goes really like you know, into the last thing that I want to talk about was around you know how, how can how can data scientists and data teams be more impactful in and out of organizations you know initially I was going to talk about this in the context of LinkedIn you know I, I know that must sound seem like a lifetime um ago, ago for you but I, I don't think it's like going out on them to say that it was pretty pretty in terms of technology companies really investing in using data in a product centric way, you know, those before that, you know, the, you know, th there was the Hadoops of the world and the big, the big data moment, just in, from an infrastructure perspective, we saw Yahoo and Google and, and Facebook really using them, but you know, LinkedIn was kind of punching above its weight at the time and what they were doing, like, whether it be the stuff like people, you may know, you know, recommending jobs to folks and all, all, all that good stuff. I, I, I think it's like one thing you've told me about about that experience was that you had a great relationship with the leader team, leadership team and the board, and that really opened um, a lot of doors for the data team in general. How, how do you, how do you think like, you know, when, when you think about now, now, you know, almost like the, over a decade on where we still hear about these same kind of problems that data and machine learning teams are running into around, you know, getting buy-in from the rest of the organization. How, how would you suggest, you know, data scientists try to be the most impactful in their organization? Oh, there's so many thoughts that come to mind. Maybe the first is it, it kind of starts with trying to understand who your customers are in the company and who the other people are. Like, you know, people I think were always surprised like how I was somewhat spending my time trying to learn about a day in a life of everybody else in the company. Cause it was just kind of like, what sucks? And then my job was to say, let's make it suck a little less. Yeah. I remember I was out at our call center in, in Oklahoma and 
And I was just like, wait, what? You're dealing with this spam? I was like, we could just reconfigure your the Barracuda like system. Yeah. And like, like, that's not supposed to be a problem. No one had ever asked them. So now suddenly I had a different relationship and, and it may seem trivial, but when I needed something, they were gonna come to bat. Yeah. Or we would like build out this technology layer and we're like, look, it might be able to help you guys on this problem and help you over here on this problem. And they'd be like, we're in. You know why you're in? Because this is a bet on you. Now, the other part that is equally important in this is that we had an amazing team. You had Jonathan Goldman, uh, who created People You May Know. You have Steve Stegman, who did Who Viewed My Profile. You had Monica Rigatti, who built out the job talent matching algorithm. I remember like Monica, Jay Kreps, founder of Confluent, creator of Kafka. A bunch of us went to the Hadoop world, like the early Hadoop things. And we're like, oh my gosh, we know nothing. We're like, we're, we're like, oh, this is so embarrassing. We're like, we're like the idiots here. And I, I remember getting the team together afterwards and being like, next year, we're the presenters. We will figure it, like, tell me what it's going to take to get us here. We're going to get this done. And what it took, the team would come back with ideas. And my job was to figure out how to get the door open. If that meant figuring out how to convince the executive team, the storytelling, it's no different than doing what you've had to do with, with, with you know, starting something. It's like you have like, Somebody has to listen to you. You have to find a way to get it done. And, and you have to tell a story. And then you have to deliver. And so we had a saying is like, we never miss our deadlines or our deliverables. We never miss it. We say we're going to do something, we do it. And, and so we used to, uh, to joke, we were like literally the analytics team, the A team, as in the, the TV show, or depending on how old you are, the movie. <laughs> and and it's... It, it was like, yeah, if you can find us, you can hire us, we will solve your problem. And you develop that mantra and that approach. And then you're, you're able with people across the organization to craft a vision. And by the way, it's not always nice. It's a lot of times that make it seem like it's all roses. There's knockdown, drag out political fights, all these issues, all the, the horse trading. And what we're looking for, never let a crisis go to waste show you can add value, take a pain away from a person, add the value on top of it. And then before you know it, you start to develop that momentum. The momentum starts and then people are like, it's easy to double down on momentum. It's hard to double down on nothing. And, and the, why have we done, spent so much time since those days of LinkedIn storytelling? It's to allow other people out there to take our stories and go to executives or other people who may be naysayers and say, see, this worked. Yeah. We could do this too. And to, to know that this broader community is a team sport and that if we all kind of move together, you can do it. If, you, if somebody is struggling to, to get buy-in in a company, tell them there was a time where there was no chief data scientist and someone had to have conviction to have the courage to make that impact and the transformation that that has led to around the world. If that can happen at the largest, most bureaucratic institution in the world, it sure as heck can happen at a startup or some other Fortune 500 company. Absolutely. And, and I think that's a, you're remarkably consistent across your experiences about what you preach. You know, it, it did like we did listen to people, invest in relationships and go above and beyond. It's pretty much simple. <laughs> no. and, and the other part, which is important in this, is have fun doing it. And if you've got the right people around you, it's a joy. It's, it's fun. If, if it's not, and it's, it, it sucks, and somebody's not treating you with the respect you deserve, they put you in a box that is not, like, is, is too limiting, or they don't view your skills because they can't have an inclusive mindset, you need to move on. You need to figure out how to get yourself into a place where you deserve that because no one should ever be in a situation where that's happened. You should be always in a home or a place where people, you can be their best version of yourself. And I say that from a position of incredible privilege. I recognize that, but I also want people to try to know that there's there aren't alone and that if you make it a team sport, others will help you get into the right place. Yeah, absolutely. I think it is 
it's, it's very much what you said earlier, which is, you know, if you don't think you can have an impact, whether that's because it's too early for the problem or the people around you being, you know, supportive, I think try your best, but it's, it's also okay to cut your losses. And I think like, this is very much true with like folks I've talked to at like, companies, you know, working in teams and data, data projects for sure, which is a lot of people, you know, they, they don't you know, spend a week in time boxes, right? Like, this is how much time I'm going to spend solving this problem. If you don't make the progress you want, document your finding uh, and, and have it ready for when that next time comes around to use that word. Totally. That, that people think I haven't had any failures. That's far from it. I've had so many colossal catastrophic failures and that's okay. Like it, what, what just picked me up at the end of the day is like, like you said, put it in a box, move on, take those lessons, learn, apply them later. And sometimes, you know what, some of the stuff is baggage that isn't helpful, especially the emotional part. And you got to find a way to let go of it and move on. Yeah. Well, I think it's a really, really good point to end. Thank you so much for having the time. I think everyone's going to really enjoy this and um, yeah, thanks. My pleasure.